Well, good evening. Welcome to the broadcast here tonight at Beacon Baptist Church. It is Wednesday, July the 21st. It's good to see you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. I do apologize. This uh, last uh, last Wednesday and the weekend, we are having a lot of internet outages here uh, in our area, and I think we're back up and live and, and running. So good to see you here today. Hope your week's been good. Uh, anything exciting for you? First time maybe this past week, a new restaurant you tried, a new experience you had, uh, went to a new park, uh, went to something you know you've never been to before, and I always like to ask my class that every week uh, when we meet here together. Again, it's good to see you uh, here tonight. Again, this is uh, Wednesday night, July the 21st, and I uh, hope you're doing well wherever it is you're watching from. And uh, boy, I tell you, it's hard. I know, I feel, I feel like I say this every week. Um, but I can't fathom how quick summer's going, and uh, boy, it's almost done, it feels like, and the school will be starting back up soon, and uh, eager kind of for the schedules to get uh, back around, you know, and uh, what a joy uh, that'll be when all that takes place. As always, throughout any of our lessons, uh, you can reach out to me anytime in the comments section uh, there below, or you can email me at Eric Faust, E R I C F O U S T at beaconbaptist.org. You can find out all the information about our church at beaconbaptist.org and get updates about next events. Uh, this coming Sunday, we have uh, Pastor Emeritus um, uh, Sam Davison uh, from Oklahoma going to be with us speaking. It'll be a wonderful day, God and Country Day here. Enjoy, uh, or in, like to invite you to enjoy uh, the day with us at 1030 this coming Sunday. If you have your Bible, join me tonight in Genesis 39. And uh, again, I hope you are blessed and encouraged here Tonight, we have now for the last number of weeks uh, gone, been uh, diving and working through the life of Joseph. Not every specific detail, but particularly highlighting some circumstances and life altering events. Someone once said, Never criticize someone until you have walked a mile in their shoes. That way, when you criticize them, you'll be a mile away and you'll have their shoes, you know. <laughs> Indeed. You know, if there was ever a person that experienced all the emotions and all the successes and all the valleys of life, it was surely Joseph. If there had ever been a person who had been uprooted from home and replanted again and again and again and again and again and again, it would have been Joseph. Though the life of Joseph, we see an amazing, you know, I'm sorry, through the life of Joseph, we see an amazing attribute of God on display. And that is this, though things change, environments change, circumstances change, people change, feelings change, God never changes. So God is demonstrating to you and to I a stability in his character and a reliability exemplified or illustrated through the life of Joseph that no matter what change comes our way, we can trust his plan. You see, Joseph believed that if God is stable, and if God is unmovable during the seasons of change, therefore, he could be too. This belief was an anchor for Joseph's soul as he navigated the storms of Egypt. Now, I don't know if you're into TV uh, much. I am not too much into it myself. We uh, click on a program here or there, but not uh, super involved. But there was one show uh, in recent years that uh, caught my attention. I love the outdoors. And in 2015, a new show came on called Alone. Now, the basic premise of, of this show is to live in a specific location, uh, in a, a wild uh, location of their choosing, and whoever stayed there the longest uh, would win half a million dollars. Now, you are basically, if I remember right, given 10 different tools that you can choose from, from knives to, uh, to uh, different kind of rope, to a backpack, to uh, a, a fire starter, to all these things. You can pick 10. You're dropped off in a very remote part of the Vancouver Islands, and whoever lasts the longest wins. At any moment, you can call on this particular phone, and uh, you can call, and they'll come and pick you up off the island. But once you're picked up off the island, um, your chances of winning uh, the money are gone. 
You know, it's interesting as you watch that show, as the days go on, as people learn how to live and find water and find food and find and build shelter and live with wolves and live with bears and cougars and all of these things, uh, we come to see some amazing things. Now, I'll be honest with you, who in here would endure this for half a million dollars? Anybody watching tonight? You say, oh, yeah, yeah, I would do it. Now, as of now, I think the record holder is 87 days. Somebody lived on, uh, on I believe it was Vancouver Island during that season, um, the longest, and won that half a million dollars. The last one that I watched, I think it was 47 or 57 days. I think it was 57 days the man made it. Now, how many here would gladly take the $500,000 without having to go through the first part? Any, anybody watching tonight? Anybody like, yeah, I mean, sure, I'll take the half a million. If I could just have the half a million and not have to go out there and do all that other crazy stuff, I would, you know. And I think the reality is we all would. But here is the reality. Joseph would have never risen to the palace, as we're about to see next week, if he had not had to learn to live in the prison. Now, I don't know if it's just our human nature or what, but almost everyone would choose the palace and not choose the prison. Tonight, what if God's plan for your life is to end up in the palace, but you have to figure out how to live in the prison first? What if tonight God offered you all the bright hopes and promises of the future, but it all hinges on how we deal with the prison? Would we accept God's offer? If we knew our future was bright and we knew at the end of the road everything was going to be great, grand, and glorious, but God says, for now, I need you to live in the prison, how many would choose to live in the prison now? For some, they would just avoid it altogether. For some, they said, it's too hard now to enjoy that later. For some, they would say, I'd rather just enjoy it all now. But what if God's plan for your life and mine were those pit stops in the prison. Well, let's study a little bit here tonight. In Genesis 39, we are going to cover actually the, uh, the ending of Genesis 39, all of chapter 40, and most of chapter 41 um, here. Now, again, not in, in great detail, because there's a lot that goes on there, but this is basically the chapters we're going to cover here tonight. Over in Genesis 39, beginning in verse number 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with him, with Joseph, and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Chapter 40, you read about the butler and the baker. Chapter 41, join me in the last verse. I'm sorry, in verse number 46. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. The title of our lesson here tonight is simply, we've gone th looked at Joseph as Joseph the slave man. We've looked at Joseph the successful man. And tonight I want to conclude with this section of Joseph's life as Joseph the slandered man. Joseph the slandered man. Would you pray with me? Father, please guide us here tonight. Lord, if this is your word and your truth, and I pray tonight we glean some help from it. Help us realize what Joseph is going through, and Lord, see how we can apply it to our hearts and our lives. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we come to understand from previous weeks and from Bible understanding and chronology that Joseph entered Egypt somewhere between the age of 17 and the age of 18 years old. Now, we read there in Genesis chapter 41, after the time in the prison, that when Joseph stands before Pharaoh right after the prison, he is 30 years old. So the truth is, we don't know exactly for sure how many years Joseph was in prison. We know at least two, 
But to be honest with you, many Bible scholars and uh, those who have given themselves to biblical history agree that um, he had served Potiphar long enough for his affairs to prosper exceedingly, most likely two to three years. And so then many scholars think that Joseph would have uh, been around 20 years old, possibly, when uh, the prison doors were slammed behind him. If this is the case, Joseph spins from chapter 39 to chapter 41, nearly somewhere in the ballpark of 10 long years of his life in the deepest, darkest, dungiest prison of Pharaoh. Now, who would agree that's a long time? That's a long time. Now, let me ask you a question here. Feel free to put it in the comment section or just answer it uh, out loud wherever you're watching from here. Why was Joseph put into prison in the first place? Why is he here? Why is he in this situation? Why is he rotting in prison? Think about it. Uh, that's right. You got it. That's right. Because of slander. Because Potiphar's wife lied about what Joseph had done. So Joseph, if you think about it, is in this sit the situation that he is in because of somebody else's doings. How many, how, how many would say there is some kind of hurt, some kind of pain, some kind of trouble you have to deal with almost on a daily basis or sometime throughout your life because of what someone else said, did, or did not do? I think probably every hand would be raised. And so here is Joseph now in this situation because of somebody else. He did the right thing. He fled. He stayed right before his God. He learned from his family example of what bad morality does. And he stayed away from it. But because of Potiphar's wife being lying about him, now he is faced with a situation because somebody else has slandered him. The story is told of Ricky Jackson, 59 years old. And this is a news article, and it goes like this. Ricky Jackson, 59, is sprawled across a leather couch in the basement of his new house in Cleveland, Ohio, some 20 miles east of Cleveland. His Nike-clad feet are propped up on the end table. An Apple iPhone rests on his chest. There are some famed portraits of Bob Marley, flags uh, commemorating the Cleveland Cavaliers championship, numerous books, including stories by uh, uh, J.G. Ballard, and one of the most ancient Egyptian mythology, a small bear, a neon sign, blinks, man cave. As the interviewer is interviewing Ricky Jackson, he says, I intend to live well. Jackson continues pouring himself a glass of pomegranate juice, but it has nothing to do with whether I'm here in this nice house or whether I'm homeless. It has to do with attitude. I've been given an opportunity, you understand, and I'm not going to waste it by holding grudges. Not that anyone would blame him. Beginning at age 18, Jackson spent 39 years in an Ohio prison for a crime that he did not commit. The longest prison term for an exonerated defendant in American history. And a staggering uh, example, uh, or ex ex it was overwhelming, being out after all this time, Jackson says, I, did, I just did my best to stay grounded, to get the little things done, to get a driver's license, find an apartment. He bought a used car, started a business with friends, refurbing, refurbishing houses around Cleveland. When the settlement money came in from the state, nearly a million dollars, he bought the new house for himself and his, fine, his fiance, whom he met through his niece. It's interesting, as the article goes on again, so Ricky Jackson has been in prison for 39 years for a crime he has not done. At the end of the article, I love what he says. He is still getting used to his, what he calls, rebirth. He tries to keep busy, traveling to construction sites, speaking at conferences and other events about his time in prison. He's planning trips to Ireland and to Jamaica. In the evening, he reads or helps his, fi his fiancé's three kids with their homework. He stays in touch with Brigman brothers, friends who understand what he's been through. Eddie Vernon met with Jackson and, and Brigman's after their exonerations and apologized for... Um, also, this is the man that, or a young fellow that accused him. 
Jackson forgives him. He was just this goofy little kid who told a whopper, Jackson says. Besides, it wasn't only Vernon that puts us there. It was the lawyers, the police, the whole broken system. And there are a lot of innocent men there who are never going to get justice. In this sense, I feel lucky. The truth is, the story is, here's a man who spent 39 years in prison for something he did not do. At the end of the day, he said, you know what, I feel lucky. He said, I'm not going to allow my life to be determined by grudges. Here's a fellow that literally for 39 years of his life was taken away, but has found a way after getting out how not to hold grudges, how to forgive those. And tonight what I'm interested in, in is this, is now we see Joseph in this new light where, man, he came to Egypt now as a slave dealing with that, and then he became a success and all the temptations that came with that. But now we find him in prison for something he didn't do, most likely 10 years of his life, rotting in prison for something he didn't do. Surely that would change a man. Surely his faith in God would dwindle. Surely his belief that God had a plan anymore in his life. I mean, surely he would say, God, I don't believe you anymore. <laughs> enough is enough. But we're about to unbark, or what we're about to understand about Joseph is some amazing truths and some amazing realities about a man who understood God. So here's three things I want us to consider when we think about Joseph, the slandered man, facing what he is facing now, number one, we come to understand this about Joseph. Joseph recognized that God never left him despite the ever-changing elements of life. Notice there in verse number 21 of chapter 39, but the Lord was with him, was with Joseph, where? In the prison. We will come to find over and over again in Joseph's circumstances, they constantly change. I've said it a million times. But one thing you will find over and over again in the scripture, but the Lord was with Joseph. You see, God never expected Joseph to walk down a road or to live in a house that he was not already there or willing to go with him to. Now, human nature says, you go ahead and I'll catch up. God says, I'm already ahead of you and have prepared the best path for you. You see, God was teaching Joseph, uh, Joseph, you and I, a powerful truth. That is, if you were to draw out your life like a board game, we oftentimes always want to get to that, that one space in Candyland. My kids love Candyland. Or if you roll the certain dice and you land where the lollipop is, you can jump this whole section of the board. And so you can literally, if you roll the dice right, you can jump the board in about five moves. But understand, that's not how life works. I know we want to get out of jail quick card. I know we want to hurry up and go and get and pass all these things. But beloved, we got to understand that sometimes God allows the prison times of life for us to recognize that maybe God is actually there in the prison. Maybe God didn't leave you. Maybe what you're going through right here and right now is actually all a part of God's path for your life. Now, I'm not saying the evils that have beset you have been put there by God. But what I'm saying is this, because of choices and other people's choices in your life may have affected that path. But understand, God has not gotten off your path. He is still right there with you. You might be here listening to the program tonight, and you're saying, man, I am so alone. Beloved, you're not alone. I'm so afraid. You don't have to be afraid. You see, I'm so overwhelmed. Go to the one who has overcome. You see, friend, he hasn't left you. You are not walking through this life of room. I know our flesh and our world and Satan wants to deceive you and to deceive me, thinking that God doesn't care. But can I encourage you? God cares. He cares. And Joseph realized that God never left him, despite the changes. I think we could all testify of friends and people in our life that have left when circumstances change. But can I encourage you tonight, no matter what has changed, God has not changed. He said, I am with you. And if he is, then he said, if he says he is, then friend, he is. Let me give you a second thing we find here about Joseph going through this time of being slandered. Notice number two, I wrote this down. 
Joseph resolved to trust God even when men would forget him. One of the stories you find in chapter number 40 is when Joseph is in prison. Again, God used him, I think, all of his character attributes and the integrity and his faith in God that he had in the preceding chapters. He just continued it in the prison because circumstances didn't change Joseph because circumstances didn't change his God. And he wanted to be like his God. And so we find here in chapter 40, there's a butler and a baker. They each have a dream. They go to Joseph. It's so interesting, the, the, the whole story. Joseph comes in freely into their cell, and it's, Joseph literally has uh, uh, power and authority over all the uh, cell blocks. He probably checked himself into his own cell every night. I mean, just, just an amazing thing is going on here. And he walks in, into the butler and the baker's cell block, and they shared their dreams. One was going to be set free in three days, and the other was going, and then the baker was going to be executed. The butler set free, and the baker was going to be executed on Pharaoh's birthday. It's interesting, as Joseph is interpreting their dreams, which, by the way, in verse 8 of chapter 40, do not interpretations belong to God. And again, he simply says, listen, these interpretations are from God. Can I, oh, I've got to turn Yoda around. We've got to keep Yoda facing forward today. I don't have my coffee, so Yoda wins today, all right? And uh, anyway... But in verse number 8, we simply find that all interpretations belong to God. Joseph said, I can't just create this stuff. This has to come from God himself. So he tells them, that he tells them the interpretation <clears throat> of the uh, dreams. One lives, one will die. But notice in verse number 14. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show me kindness, I pray thee unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. And so simply, what is Joseph's re? request. <laughs> he said, please, 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 please get me out of here. He said, listen, God has used me to help you. When you get to where you're going, get me out of here. Find a way to get me out of here. But notice what verse 23 says, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, that last three words, but forget him. You know, we all have the tendency to turn to man for answers in our darkest hours of light. By the way, it's not that you're wrong in doing that. God designed all levels of relationship to help meet these needs. But we must understand, like Job, that man doesn't always have the right answer. Though we may have put our best intentions forward or best intentions out there, it doesn't mean that they're always really going to help. Remember in Job's story, uh, when after all of his friends gave all their different conclusions to why Job was going through what he's going through, what did he say? Miserable comforters are ye. He said, listen, y'all, y'all terrible. <laughs> like, man, uh, with friends like you, who needs enemies? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Remember that no man is going to have a God-sized answer to your need. Only God does. Joseph wasn't angry, nor did he hate the butler. But realize there is only things that God can do in, in his life and in ours. I want, to ask you, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is there something you are trying to change? You're trying to move. You're putting all your efforts into or all your time into just to see it not move or change. You know, it may be that you need to seek God about that thing. Could it be God isn't removing it because deep down inside God knows that it's what's best for you and what's best for me? I can't speak for God, but I can tell you this. God did not deliver Joseph out of the prison when he thought he would be delivered. We come to understand in chapter 41 and verse 1, and it came to pass at the end of two full years. So two years after the butler is released, for two years, he wondered, huh, for two years, where are you at, God? What's going on? What is all of this? We come to find out that a God-sized problem takes a God-sized God to take care of it. You see, there'll be many times in your life and in mine when situations come and things change. And there's nothing wrong with seeking human um, uh, interaction, trying to find help. This way God designed it. There's nothing wrong with that. But understand, there are some things that there is nobody but God that can fix and that can help you through. 
And here is Joseph saying, oh, tell the butler, don't, uh, butler uh, uh, tell Potiphar, I mean, tell Pharaoh, you know, there's a pretty good guy down here in the prison. What was he doing? He was trusting in man. Man will take care of it. Man will resolve it. You know, there'll be some things in your marriage you cannot resolve aside from the hand of God in it. There'll be some things, uh, maybe you're in a broken relationship. There are some things that will not be healed or fixed unless you allow God to get in that thing. Listen, quit looking to man. Quit getting angry. Quit allow, allowing your bitterness and fierceness to infest everyone else. Turn it over to God. If you complain more to man than pray to God about, about, about your particular situation, then friend, you and I are out of balance. We're out of balance. And I'm telling you here, man, from life experience and from what I have seen played out throughout, throughout the scripture, you are setting yourself up, you're setting yourself on a course of destruction. I'm telling you. If you don't get to the place in your life where you realize God is bigger than you, he is bigger than any problem, bigger than uh, the marriage that fell, fell apart, bigger than the anything, then, beloved, you're setting yourself up for a life of blaming God, blaming others, and eventually you'll turn around and wonder, where did your life go? So Joseph resolved to trust God when men would forget him. Well, how come so-and-so, listen, listen, you can't control everybody else. I can't control everybody else. I'd try my best to control me, <laughs> you see. You know, I can do what's right whether the other person does or not. And many folks, we must learn there are some problems that only God can fix because God is the one that wants to fix them. If you're trying to fix it over and over and it's not being fixed, I want to challenge you. Turn to the one who made us all. Turn, turn to the one who created every relationship and knows how to heal every broken and hurting relationship. Turn to the one who really knows the answers. And I tell you, friend, I believe you'll find some help. Let me give you a third thing we find about Joseph, and I'm done. You see, Joseph remembered that though man may leave, God never does. I believe Joseph learned during this two-year period that just because you may want something doesn't mean you need it. Question, what if Joseph was let out of prison two years sooner? Would the position be available to rise to the palace? Would everything been in place for Joseph to become the man God will use to save Israel? Probably not. And the point is this, though Joseph wanted out, God says, I need you to stay in. But God is uncomfortable. God says, listen, I need you there. I need you there. Now, I don't want to go down all, the, all of those roads and what that can mean, but understand this. God had a plan. Notice this when Joseph does get out two years later and standing before Pharaoh, notice his answer when it comes to Pharaoh's dreams. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You say, what's that? You see, who Joseph was two years before He's now instilled the same man. His trust is in that God may never leave. Though man walks out and promises all kinds of things, he said, God never left me. To be honest with you, it seemed, physically speaking, all hope was gone when the butler said nothing. But the day came in God's timing when it was time. When the stage was set and everything was ready. Beloved, there's nothing like walking down a wedding aisle too soon. <laughs> and uh, when my wife and I got married, we picked out a very particular song. And uh, oh, it was so beautiful. And when we're setting up the wedding plans, you know, you have the particular song. And when this particular note starts, she's coming down the aisle and it's all set and ready. But what if she came down when it was the seating of the grandparents? It wasn't time yet, it wasn't ready. We look throughout all of our life. I get, made, uh, I, I get made fun of all the time. I'm an early eater for lunch, and uh, the earliest I eat lunch is like 10.30, all right? Now, everyone's like, Eric, 
lunch is for lunchtime. Well, lunchtime for me can be anywhere from 10.30 uh, to 1 o'clock, amen? And uh, I like to eat early. As silly as that is, everything has a time. We have a work schedule. We have a time in this life. There is a time. We can't rush it. Because God is a plan. You know, Joseph didn't allow the lies of another to keep, to keep him from trusting and depending upon his God when the time of prison came. Ten long years he waited. Faithfully, continued doing what he knew God wanted of him, and God blessed him through his darkest journey of his life. Tonight, in no way is this an exhaustive study on how to deal with every aspect of being slandered. But what I found out about Joseph, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. And now we're about to see Joseph will live the majority of his life out of prison in the palace. I know the prison times don't seem joyous. I understand that. I understand as I speak to you here through the camera that it's one thing to say, trust God, lean on God, understand the frailty of man. It's another thing to live it. And that's why I want to challenge you to take your problem, to take your need, and truly give it to God. And when, when you give it to Him, I would encourage you to ask Him, God, I'm going to give this to you. Please show me and help me. How do I walk through this time? Because, God, I need you. I know you're with me. God, I know you haven't left me here for no reason. And tonight, God, help me stay on the path that is best for my life and for your glory. Man, as always, thank you for tuning in. If there's anything I could ever do for you, please reach out. Otherwise, God bless you. We'll see you sooner than later.